Very good. Uh, speakers, guests, uh, we're just going to wait uh, uh, until like, more people come in, just one more minute, uh, and then uh, I'm going to crack on, uh, and then uh, I'm uh, going to hand it over to Shaheen. Okay, no problem. Thank you, Professor. Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's event on the, uh, actually tomorrow's election in, uh, in Iran. Um, we have the immense honor and privilege to talk about this, uh, I would argue, to a certain extent, unprecedented event with a number of literally world-leading experts who will be introduced very shortly. But before we start, just let me um, congratulate and let me thank me the school security studies, me particularly Lizzie and Danny for putting this for facilitating this incredible event, and uh, our main chair who is Shaheen Modares. Shaheen Modares, Mr. Shaheen Modares is a graduate from Louis University in Italy and a member of the Crime Extremism and Terrorism Team from the International Team from the Studies Security Verona. His expertise range from political theory to, in fact, like crime, extremism, radicalization, but he's also very knowledgeable as for uh, um, uh, Iranian domestic and international politics. That said, you know, what to say? Iran is indubitably one of the most important players in the region. Indubitably. Probably, um, it has always been a very important actor and uh, even if we think about what is happening today, as we speak, let's think of Iranian presence in southern Lebanon. Let's think of Iranian presence or influence in the Arabian Peninsula. Let's think of Iranian uh, internal politics. What is happening as we're currently speaking? Let's think of the, th of the sanctions. Let's think of the economy. Let's think of uh, internal politics. Ahmadinejad coming back in commenting on the Mossad, allegedly uh, um, uh, openly admitting its involvement uh, in, um, uh, in uh, domestic uh, Iranian politics. So the point being, it is an incredibly important country and tomorrow's election do have implications. What is going to happen inside Iran? What is going to happen beyond Iran? And uh, <laughs> I mean, as I was saying, King's College London is incredibly honored to have uh, this immense, uh, immensely relevant, uh, important uh, panel of incredible speakers, I mean, you know, for us tonight. And so without any further ado, again, thank you very much to all our guests. Thank you very much to all our panelists. Thank you very much to the school. Thank you very much to Shaheen. My name is Dr. Michele Groppi. Uh, I'm a teaching fellow here at King's College London and the president of the International Team for the Study of, of Security Verona. Welcome again. But before I hand it over to Shaheen, one very last question. Obviously, a number of topics uh, might sound pretty controversial. We have, uh, as, uh, <laughs> and let me repeat this like for the third time, incredible panelists, speakers with impressive backgrounds and uh, different experiences. Please uh, let's respect uh, all of their opinions uh, as the school warrants uh, and champions. Uh, I promise uh, that by the end uh, of the event, uh, um, I will make sure that by using the chat box uh, here that you can uh, book your spot. And if you have any questions, uh, I will do my best, uh, obviously, to make sure that uh, you can ask them. Now, there's uh, 114 people at the moment. Uh, we cannot take 114 questions, but uh, I will make sure that uh, um, at least as much as possible that you can ask uh, uh, your, your questions. Once again, guests and speakers and order organizer, uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for this event. And now without any further ado, Shaheen, whenever you want, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Grofi. On behalf of ITS Esperna and King's College London, Allow me to thank you again for accepting our invitation. Tonight with us, we are having Dr. Roxana Farma Farmanyan. She is a senior fellow research at King's College London in the Center of Divided Society and academic director of international relations and global studies at Cambridge University. Thank you for being with us. We have Mr. Mehmet Javed Anfar, lecturer on Iranian politics at the Interdisciplinary Center in Herzliya and director of Iran-Israel Observatory. 
Thank you for being with us, Mayor. We have Mr. Alex Sevatanka, the Director of Iran program, program at Middle East Institute in Washington, D.C., and consultant, United States Air Force School of Special Operations. Thank you for being with us, Alex. And from Iran, we have Professor Sadiq Zibal Kalam, Professor of Political Theory at the Faculty of Law and Political Sciences of University in Tehran, who recently published his latest book, The Birth of Israel in Iran. Thank you for being with us. Allow me to open the floor by a question addressed to all of you. On the eve of the Iranian elections, a big question that comes to the mind of people who can vote, the legitimate electors of Iran, is the fact that what is the actual role of the president in the Islamic Republic and what are his powers? We will begin in alphabetical order with Dr. Roxana Fama Farmanyan. You have five minutes. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's always a pleasure to represent Kings as a visiting fellow, uh, as well as, of course, um, fulfilling my, my role uh, from uh, the position I hold at the University of Cambridge. So it's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for having me. And indeed, it is an important evening, uh, the day before the election. And I would say it's a very important uh, election because it's very unusual. And I would say also it's important because the position of the president, although it is not thought the almost monarchical position powers that the Supreme Leader has, it is nonetheless the highest elected office in Iran. And it does have a full campaign and electoral season. And it is usually thought of as a referendum on the performance of the government and the leadership every uh, time that it takes place every four years. And I think that um, as a result, we should see it as a civilian or as a, as a population demographically represented in uh, the government. The president also carries uh, the right to establish a cabinet. And uh, certainly several members of that cabinet are absolutely critical to the image of Iran abroad. The uh, extremely powerful clerical aspect of leadership, although it's in many ways more powerful than the elected uh, government positions, including the president, are also much less uh, visible outside Iran and sometimes even inside Iran. So the image and the interaction of the government with the people and with foreign powers really rests with the, uh, the president and his cabinet. And it is they also who very much overlap and interact with the parliament, another significant arm of government that is elected. This particular time, I think it's very interesting because the two arms, the presidency and the supreme leader position are in effect coming together because the supreme leader Ali Khamenei is uh, reaching an age where there is real debate as to whether he will be alive when the next presidential election takes place in four years. And as a re result, this president, this elected president will possibly be looking uh, over and managing the transition of the uh, position of Supreme Leader. There's only ever been one transition before. That was uh, when Khamenei, the current Supreme Leader, replaced the leader of the revolution, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini. It was a uh, very peaceful transition, it, smooth in any case. And I think that's what the regime is hoping for today. And there is even talk that should the uh, anointed choice of the regime, uh, the head of the judiciary, Ibrahim Raisi, should he be elected, that there is a possibility that this could actually pave the way for him to become uh, considered for the next supreme leadership. So there is quite a bit at stake here. However, uh, before I finish my remarks, I would like to say that Iran does occasionally produce quite uh, a number of surprises in these uh, elections. 
And although I don't think any of us would consider them completely free, certainly the selection of candidates has always been very much in the remit of the clerical uh, committees and guardian council, there nonetheless have been upsets in the past. The upsets have gone both ways too. So the first upset where the anointed and the chosen candidate of the, gov of the, of the clerical regime was overturned by a reformist, uh, Khatami. And in the second case, the anointed and chosen of the government was overturned by Ahmadinejad, who was definitely not a reformist, but a, a uh, representative of a very specific line of the hardliners. So it could go either way. And this time, and on this note, I'd like to finish my remarks. This time we have actually just two candidates left who are serious candidates. And one of them is a technocrat, uh, Hemati, and the likelihood therefore of a possible overturn is- Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Farah from Mayan. We go to Mr. Javed Amfar. May I say- Five minutes. You? Yes, of course, five minutes. Okay, thank you very much. And Please. good evening everybody. And uh, many thanks to the organizers for the timely, uh, for this timely panel. And it's great to be in the company of such great experts. And I say that without thought of, I'm uh, very humble and it's uh, wonderful to be speaking to somebody who is actually sitting in Tehran, Professor Ziba Kalam, where I would love to be, but uh, for now I can't. But um, in terms of the, uh, to answer the question, in, according to the Iranian constitution, um, you, uh, you know, in Iran, there was a post-revolution constitution and then it was changed and the changes were put to a referendum in 1989 and the people of Iran voted overwhelmingly in, in, in favor of the changes. Um, what we see after <clears throat> the, uh, the point when Ayatollah Khamenei becomes uh, the Supreme Leader, we see the position of the president gradually weakening. We see the Republican institutions, which are uh, elected by the people, being weakened at the expense of the revolutionary institutions, as it's called, who are becoming stronger. And this is something that actually, you know, in Tehran, before the, uh, these elections, we see that they have uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, project where it's, called, where it's called the Free Tribune. Uh, to, uh, people come and speak without fear, they say their concerns. And one of the things we keep hearing from people. Uh, is that what's the point of voting for the president? He can't do much. The people of Iran voted for Mr. Afsanjani. Uh, one of the issues was development of the economy, and one of the other issues was uh, you know reduced tensions with the West. We saw he didn't get very far. The, the revolution institutions uh, created a lot of problems for him. For example, he wanted to have better relations with Saudi Arabia. We saw the Hobar power bombings in 1996. Um, there are other examples I can tell you. So, and then we have Mr. Khatami who came to power and one of his promises was implementation of the constitution. Um, because the constitution in Iran is unfortunately not, even the current constitution is not implemented. Um, and if the, if the Iranian people have the rights which are afforded to them by the Iranian constitution, uh, they, would have a, they would have much more freedoms, but they don't. So what I'm trying to say is that although the constitution gives the, the president much more rights and much more uh, authority. But what people see is that, especially during Mr. Ha uh, Rouhani, is that the government cannot do much. So what's the point of voting? What's the point of voting when there were demonstrations, um, according to some report, November 2019, according to one report, a thousand were killed, according to another report, 1,500, pick, pick any number you think is more accurate. Mr. Rouhani does, didn't say anything. The reformists didn't say anything. Then it turns out, you know, the whole Ukraine plane crash. The president did not know. He says, I didn't own, I only found out, you know, the story, those who have followed it. The government looked completely incompetent. Then, of course, the, the most important was the, the Said Leila's interview with the foreign minister, Javad Zarif. He basically said, you know, I'm the foreign minister. I did not know that the, the flight, there were flights to Syria. I did not know, you know, and that the, 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 the um, the basically revolution institutions, which includes the IRGC, were undermining the old step of the way and they almost ruined the nuclear deal with the, uh, with the Americans by 
Mr. Qasem uh, Soleimani going and meeting with the Russians. So on the one hand, we have the constitution that gives rights, much more rights to the people's representative, the president. But in reality, we see that the president really does not have much power. So uh, tomorrow, I, I agree with Professor Tamo Famayan. I actually think if you know the candidates and Mati is the most qualified, this is what people of Iran really need, I, in my opinion, somebody who understands economy and other, you know, that the, the real bread and butter issue, which the economy is one of the most important issues. Even if he wins, let's imagine a scenario of if, if, if he wins. What, what can he do really? What can he do? There were people who are with a far more uh, stronger background than him. Uh, Mr. Rouhani, who was the Supreme Leader's representative at the Supreme National Supreme Council for 10 years, is somebody the Supreme Leader trusted. How? He, he couldn't do much. What can Mr. Hemmati do? And I think another last point, I think that's eroded these elections is the, is the, is the comments by Mr. Moslehi, the former uh, intelligence minister, that look, they knew Rafsanjani would win in 2013 and the Guardian Council just stopped it. So I think in a way, if the turn, turnout tomorrow is low, and, it, and I think it will be low, uh, the people who are to blame the most is the Guardian Council. And, uh, and it's the fact that you know soon after, uh, Mr. Khamenei became Supreme Leader in 1991. He was given the right to filter all the candidates, whereas before it wasn't so involved and th then the process just became less democratic, hence undermining the position of the president and the election. Thank you, thank you so much. Mr. Batankar, the floor is yours. In your opinion, what, is, what are the true powers of the president in the Islamic Republic? Please. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. It's great to see everyone. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. And I, I really uh, just want to add to what we've already heard. Um, I am not one who believes that the presidency in the Islamic Republic really matters that much uh, when you consider what Iran is inflicted by at the moment. The crises that Iran are faced with relate to issues that the president simply just doesn't have the power to deal with it. That's why I'm not excited about the election outcome tomorrow. You know, Abdul Nasser Hemati could win tomorrow or Ibrahim Raisi could win tomorrow. I frankly think it, it makes very little difference to the key issues that the country of Iran, the people of Iran face with. On the uh, nuclear front, uh, you know, whoever wins, the nuclear talks in Vienna will continue. Uh, and I, you know, I would say in terms of the future of US-Iran relations, they will continue. I think Iran's regional activity agenda will continue. Uh, don't expect major changes in Iranian policies in Iraq, in Lebanon, in Syria, uh, and so forth, just because there's a new president after tomorrow's election. If there is a, a winner after this first round, it could turn into be a two round um, race, we will see. I'm not excited because, as as you heard, uh, uh, you know already, uh, there, there's a rich history of presidents coming um, to power in the Islamic Republic with all sorts of promises, with the hopes of the Iranian people behind them that they're going to take a different turn, that they're going to go in a different direction. Because all Iranians hate to see another bloody revolution. No Iranian wants to try another revolution. This is why they keep voting for whoever they. Uh, system put in front of them. They always choose the most moderate. I mean, today, uh, the most moderate is Abdul Nasser Ahmed, who is not a reformist, who is a technocrat. He has no uh, political background. Uh, but yet, he's the only one who has said certain things that you could construe as criticism of the status quo. But if you really want to change the status quo, you have to touch on some of those very sensitive issues that incidentally, the seven men who were in this race were told beforehand, do not even go there. So we saw in the three presidential debates, don't talk about the American question. Don't talk about Iran's regional agenda. Don't talk about anything that's a red line for Ayatollah Khamenei or the Revolution Guards. You know, with a environment like this, you will never have change. You will have an echo chamber. You'll have people who believe that their way is the only way, you know, repeating the same messages. This is extremely dangerous for the survival of the Islamic Republic because they don't want outsiders to have a say. And I think that's why the presidency really at this moment doesn't matter. 
Ibrahim Raisi uh, is, you know, you could make the argument that if you found the right person, a courageous person who might go through the Guardian Council filter and become president and stand up to Ayatollah Khamenei and the Revolutionary Guards. Because there are two entities that are against change in Iran. It's Ayatollah Khamenei and it's the Revolutionary Guards. They matter more than anyone else. Let's say you have a president who's brave and can stand up and speak truth to power to, to those two centers of power. Is Ibrahim Raisi that person? Absolutely not. Ibrahim Raisi is only in this race because he's backed fully by Ayatollah Khamenei, the Revolutionary Guards, the rest of the state machinery. There is no other reason for Ibrahim Raisi to be in this race. He's not a great orator. He doesn't have a vision. He's a technocrat. We didn't know about Ibrahim Raisi in 2017. And now suddenly he's a presidential front runner and a potential supreme leader. Because inside the regime, there is enough energy around him, not because they think he's a great, glorious individual with wonderful ideas for the future, but because they think they can control him, because they think he can keep the regime intact. And the big challenge for, and I'll finish here, the big, big challenge for Raisi and Khamenei and those people who have engineered this election is, do they really think continuing the path of the last 30 some years that Khamenei has been supreme leader. Is that gonna make this regime survive? Do they think they can continue to be on this path? I doubt it very much. That's a risk they have to take. But long story short, you know, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, when he was president, he didn't dare say anything. It's only after his presidency, he dares to speak the truth. Imagine if you had a president who could do it when they were actually in the presidential palace. But that's why they have a filter and they make sure only people they can control get to run for the presidency. Thank you. Thank you so much. Professor Ziba Kadam, same question to you. What are the real powers of the president in the Islamic Republic? And from my understanding, allow me to add the fact that, as also our guest uh, somehow indicated that, during the presidential debates, we come to an understanding, at least I came to this understanding, that many, many of these people do not have neither the academic knowledge nor the practical experience to run a country. In your opinion, is the president really a president in the Islamic Republic? The floor is yours. Bismillah uh, rahman rahim I think uh, this election would be uh, a turning point in the history of the Islamic Republic. Because up until now, more or less, uh, the majority of the voters above 50 percent mark took part in the election. They either voted for Rouhani or voted for Ahmadinejad. But the important issue was that more than 50 percent took part in the election. So the regime took it as a referendum because there are many voices inside the country and outside which uh, insist on a referendum. They say that after 42 years of the, of the Islamic constitution, or new generation, uh, that the leader of the uh, revolution, late uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, said himself at the beginning of the revolution that uh, each generation has to choose their own way of uh, government. So uh, the fact that our fathers elected the Islamic Republic for us, it doesn't mean that we have to accept it. No. The best reply from the Islamic establishment was that, well, look, you saw for yourself, uh, more than 50% of the people uh, participated in, in, in the election. It means that in an indirect way, it means that uh, the people uh, ratified uh, with, with their vote, with their uh, going to the ballot box, that they still support the Islamic Republic. Now, why it will be a turning point? Because this time, all the, the statistics uh, show that less than 50% will take part in the election. So going back to the, to, the, to the point that the regime itself is, has established 
during the past few decades that, uh, the, uh, that, 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 that the, the figure is very important when the people take part in the election. By the same token, we could say that it will be a turning point because it means that uh, the, uh, the majority will not take part in, in the election, which means that the majority of the of, of Iranian do not support the Islamic Republic any longer. <laughs> that's uh, that's uh, uh, the crucial uh, result of this election. Now, the second important development of this election is that there have been a lot of discussion as to what is the role of a president. If the decisions are taken by the supreme leader, if the decisions are taken by the revolutionary guard, what's the point of people going to the ballot box and choosing a president? Mm -hmm. I think because of these uh, these uh, 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 powerful criticism that, 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 that have been levied against uh, the fact that the uh, Iranian president really has no power. I think this time we would observe that regardless of who is the president, Raisi or someone else, the system would allow him to have some more power. Particularly, particularly if that president is, is uh, Mr. Raisi, who is trusted fully by the establishment, then he will, uh, then he will, uh, he will have even more uh, power. Now, what does it mean in practice? It means that the uh, JCPO uh, uh, negotiation, it will, it will go through that the Iranian uh, negotiator would reach uh, uh, a deal with the United States over the, over the uh, nuclear issue. Now, does that mean that on other issues there would be agreement such as Iranian military presence in, in Yemen, in, in Syria, in Lebanon, um, the call for annihilation uh, of the state of Israel, would we be able to see changes um, in that respect? Would we see um, the, would we see a detente as far as relation be between Iran? Thank you, sir. We cannot hear you. You're muted, and also the time is over. I should move to our next guest. Thank you. If the, the, I think it would be be uh, the, the too much of uh, of expectation. However. However, sir, thank you so much. We will be back to you in the next round. I have to respect the time. Yeah. Frame. Thank you. Dr. Farmer Farmayan, as we heard, a problem that is being created and it's showing itself today in Iran is the fact that many people in the streets of Iran are actually using these public tribunes to say the fact that they are frustrated, that they need change, that they are shouting for a referendum. Also, Polls from within the country demonstrate that from the eligible electorates in Iran, almost 70, approximately 70% will not be participating in these elections. Is Islamic Republic facing a legitimacy crisis? The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, well, there certainly have been uh, a great deal of complaints about how this process is running at the moment, how the regime is running and the lack of trust that's very clear among the population in the face of sanctions, in the face of economic hardship, and in the face of, of rampant COVID as well. And there certainly has been a hashtag being sent around the uh, country, particularly among the young people, of no to Islamic Republic, which uh, really relates directly back to what um, uh, Professor Ziva Kalam has said. I find that it's quite interesting though, because indeed I think this is a turning point, but I think we've, we are already going around this turning point because in the past, although we know that these have not been uh, free elections ever, because there's always been a selection of candidates, that selection always reflected that didn't reflect the demographics, it didn't reflect the people in the past, but it did always reflect the parties, the different groups in the government. 
And this time it doesn't. And I think that's already a key reflection of how the situation within the government and its desire to control the situation has changed substantially. And so it cannot be a referendum on the Islamic uh, uh, Republic simply because the Republic itself is not represented in that group of, of candidates. I think that um, the element of how this is going to be respect, uh, reflected in the ballot box is unclear. We know that 30% have said they will not vote. Uh, we know that- uh, 70% have said that they will not vote. And I'm quoting ISPA, the poll from between Iran. I've seen various, I'm sure that's the case. There's, Iran is notoriously hard to, to, to uh, pin down. And actually any population about to go to the polls is very difficult to pin down, which is why one tends to have exit polls. I have also heard that there's about 30%, let's, let's start the other way around to be on the same uh, plane there for it. 30% are saying they will vote. I think what we're seeing among the rest is that some are definitely not going to vote, but some have not made up their mind. And I think that is where the, um, the mystery here may lie. Will they vote uh, for, for Hemati? Will they vote for Raisi? We don't know. And um, that percentage is going to play a huge role as to the legitimacy of this, uh, of this president. I'm not so sure I agree with um, Dr. Ziba Khalam in terms of whether he will gain power, because if he doesn't gain a great number of votes, I think it becomes extremely difficult for the government to then say he has the confidence of the people. So I think we have actually quite a lot to see tomorrow as to how, how this is going to play out. Thank you. Mary, same question to you, but allow me first to introduce a very brief introduction that in the origins of totalitarianism, Hannah Arendt describes this third phase for totalitarian regimes saying that in the third phase, they begin to make the inner circle stricter and stricter. We can see that people such as Ali Arijani, Speaker of the House, was not approved by the Guardian Council to be a candidate. Can we also say that they have achieved the third phase of a totalitarian regime? The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Five minutes again? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, look, um, please allow me just to address a point and it's related to what you, what, what you, you asked, Shainja. Um, you know, Professor Zibak Alam said because uh, Mr. Raisi, or sorry, Dr. Raisi, apparently he's also a doctor, he has a PhD apparently, also his wife also has a PhD, um, uh, said, you know, the fact that he's close to, if, if Raisi is close to the system, then he's going to get more help. Yes, we saw that in Mr. Ahmadinejad's first term, actually. Uh, we saw that the, that the IRGC's financial organizations cut a lot of stack, slack for him. Also, when Mr. Ahmadinejad was the mayor of Tehran, they also uh, gave him huge loans, which were not repaid. So being close to the hukumat, uh, to, the, to the system, to the nizam, to the, to the regime, actually can open a lot of doors for you when compared to when somebody is not from within the system such as Khatami or, or later on even Rouhani, who wasn't, you know, he was more with the Rafsanjani crowd than, 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 the, than the inner circles of the Nizam. But we saw what happened to Ahmadinejad in his second term, he fell out. So if Mr. Raisi now goes and he has the support of the, uh, of the establishment, then there's no guarantee that in the second term he's still going to have it because they, they fall out. In terms of the Islamic Republic, look, I think one of the biggest reasons, uh, I think that description is right. I think the more, the, one of the biggest reasons why the Islamic Republic is increasingly and in an unprecedented way uh, closing itself in, going after the Khodi, you know, just allowing the criteria for Khodi, one of us is becoming even more strict, um, is a number of two factors. One of them is the Trump sanctions. Yes, the Trump sanctions did not topple the Islamic Republic, the Trump sanctions did not get Iran to give up its nuclear program. But one thing they did was when they took away the, in the income of many of these regime organizations and the economic sanctions, instead of rallying around the flag 
these conservatives actually fought each other more viciously than before. They became more corrupt. They became even nastier to each other than before. And they mismanaged the country even in a greater manner. So that created the concern within the Islamic Republic, within the inner circles of the regime that look, we're going down because actually, instead of the people of Iran rallying around the flag after the fact that Trump walked out of the deal and imposed sanctions, we see that the people of Iran still want to have good relations with the United States. So I think that created the concern that look, people within the system now have to be filtered more because Larry Johnny was one of those people who actually believed that Iran needs to have better relations with America, not because he was an imperialist, because I think he, he subscribes to the late Prof, uh, Prime Minister Mossadegh's foreign policy doctrine of Mobazene Manfi, the negative equilibrium, to play off the supreme leader, the, the, the superpowers, to get what's best for Iran. When you only got China and Russia and you don't have the Americans to play them off against each other, China and Russia can do whatever they want to Iran. And I think this is something that Laurie Johnny wants to do. But because the Islamic Republic sees that despite what Trump did, there are still people who want to be pro-Western. And despite the fact that what Trump did, the, the Islamic Republic, instead of the hardliners rallying around the flag and actually performing better under pressure, they performed worse. And uh, I think these factors uh, create, I've, I've brought it to the, to the point where its legitimacy is increasingly under question. And I think Ayatollah Khamenei is genuinely concerned about uh, what is happening to Iran. I think the fact that the Guardian Council disqualified so many people is a great sign of weakness. It's not a sign of strength. Um, the Islamic Republic was strong when it, when it's, uh, when, you know, it used to fly on both wings, uh, the reformists and the conservatives during, for example, Khatami. But now, uh, I think you know the terrible way the uh, the, the the conservatives uh, performed. Last but not least, if I can just point one other issue, you know you could say Mr. 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 Rouhani could be the best or the worst prime minister. Ayatollah, Khamenei, sorry, President Ayatollah Khamenei could be the best or the worst supreme leader. I think what the most important factor. I think the, I don't want to say more important than human rights, but human rights is very important. But I think what really angers the people of Iran is that the state is not functioning. There is like the Nizam, the, the, the regime says it's the government's responsibility. The government says, I don't have the authority to carry out my responsibility. So you have huge issues regarding the country that are falling through a black hole and people are suffering. And I think this more than anything else is hurting the legitimacy of the Islamic Republic. It's not functioning. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. The same question to you with adding one three comments that a part of a state's legitimacy comes from its foreign relations with other countries. Iran has been terribly isolated in the recent years. Do you think this will change and how do you think this will affect its legitimacy? That's a great question. Look, if you look at 1979 revolution in Iran, it was in fact celebrated by many around the world who were in the so-called anti-American, anti-imperialist camp. It wasn't just Islamists that celebrated it. But in the revolution of Iran in 1979, very quickly took on a very xenophobic um, posture. And I would say the Islamic Republic continues to be a very xenophobic uh, entity. It's xenophobic because it doesn't trust the outside world. It doesn't like the outside world. Um, and if it engages with the outside world, it shakes to change the outside world in its own image. Um, Iran paid a heavy price for that during the Iran-Iraq war. Ayatollah Khomeini famously said, I can count our friends on the fingers of one hand. It was his fault. He started this process. Khomeini did not live, live long enough to change it. And the guy who took over from him, the individual who took over from him, Ayatollah Khomeini, I mean, he uses the word doshman, enemy, so much more than probably any other word I can think of when he describes the outside world. Um, you know, he, Ayatollah Khamenei has not left Iran since I think he went to New York in September of 1988. He doesn't even go to Mecca. He doesn't go to Karbala. He doesn't travel. He doesn't know the world. Rafsanjani, who knew the world much better than Khamenei, you know, he tried in, a, in his two term as president to take Iran in a different direction foreign policy wise. He was stopped by the Revolutionary Guards and by Khamenei for one reason. 
the outside world is a threat to them and their interest in Iran. They think they will lose out. They think they lose out power and money. That's why they keep the outside world out. Khatami's great dialogue of civilization didn't go anywhere. Again, because Khamenei and Revolutionary Guard stopped him. Mahmoud Ahmadinejad even tried in his second term, focusing on Iran first, Islam second. We all know what happened to Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. He's very lucky he's not in prison right now like his close uh, advisors. So this is a system that's xenophobic. This is a system that does not want to deal with the outside. We need the outside world for the flow of money. They need to sell the oil and get the technology. But really deep down, the, these are people who came of age politically naive and very much poorly uh, knowledgeable about the outside world. And this is the point I want to make about Ibrahim Raisi. Ibrahim Raisi is born in 1960. He was 19 years old when the revolution happened. He joined the system. This regime he's serving today for the last 42 years. To my knowledge, Ibrahim Raisi knows very little about the outside world. And because of his involvement in the execution of thousands of prisoners in 1988, he will not be able to travel around the world. In other words, he will continue the isolation of Iran, a country that is not known for its isolation. Iran is not North Korea. Iran is not supposed to be isolated. There's five to seven million Iranians around the world. So, but this, you're gonna get the same with Ibrahim Raisi. You're gonna get the same horrible, I think, narrow view of the world, of the idea that out there, there's nothing good out there. Trade with them when necessary. And they're choosing their partners very selectively. Those partners increasingly are narrowed down to two countries, Russia and China. I just don't think that's sustainable. I just don't think a country of 82 million people can sustain itself on this path going forward. There are, you know, how many more Iranians need to leave the country before you have enough uh, employment for everyone who lives in the country? I mean, these are really tough questions that I don't think Ayatollah Khamenei has answers for. And let me stop by saying this. For Ayatollah Khamenei, this election, as I said earlier, is about one thing and nothing else. It's about his succession process. It's about his succession process. It's about having someone maximum control so when the day Ayatollah Khamenei dies, there won't be any surprises. Because as the Professor Farman Farmian pointed out, Iran has had one succession in the summer of 1989. And you know what happened in 1989? It happened within 24 hours, 40, 48 hours. There was no blueprint. Nobody really knew what was going on. To this day, we don't know exactly what happened. Uh, and the, the regime can't afford something like that risky. So I think Khamenei is planning to, you know, the only reason you ask the Guardian Council to kick, to kick out someone like Ali Rajani and so many other people who are loyal members of the regime, the only reason is because you want maximum control for the succession process. That's what Thank this you. election is about. Thank you. Thank you so much. Professor Ziva Kalam, we heard that Mr. Vatakha mentioned about relations of Iran and its neighbors, external relations. But when we come to its domestic matter, its internal relations, we see this dreadful wave of suppressing activists, writers, journalists, normal people, workers such as Ismail Bakhshi who protested because they were not paid their salary who were tortured and imprisoned. In your opinion, is this also a form of legitimacy crisis? The floor, the floor is yours, sir. Uh, I believe that uh, Iran's uh, <laughs> foreign relation, uh, particularly with the West, would actually influence uh, the behavior of uh, Iran domestically, uh, Islamic regime domestically, with uh, the intelligentsia, with writers, uh, with uh, women uh, right activists, human rights activists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The reason is, 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 is somewhat very simple. We know that China and Russia don't care, uh, uh, don't give a damn uh, as far as uh, uh, human rights is concerned. However, with the West, uh, it's not uh, the same. Now, I'm not naive and I don't believe that uh, the that, that United States or, or, or the EU countries put their own national interests 
above, uh, b b b b b sorry, rather below the, 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 the Iranian um, the human right issue. No, obviously they are, uh, they are, they are more concerned of their own national interest than, um, than what's happening to political prisoners uh, in Iran, for example. However, however, if the relation between the Islamic Republic and the West is somewhat normal, is not, uh, is not uh, very hostile, then I believe that uh, Tehran would somehow be, be, be a bit more careful um, as to how it behaved towards um, its dissidents, its human rights um, activists. Now, this is not a simple uh, visual thinking. It has happened in the past that during all the, all the attack, all the rhetoric, Against the against the Western countries, nevertheless, when it comes to the question of human rights, provided that Iran's relation is, is is somewhat better than what it is at the moment, then I think it will it will uh, it will impact on um, on the human rights uh, situation. Now, for example, uh, when there was the nuclear deal. Uh, six years ago, it somehow, in my opinion, it in, in somehow affected um, um, uh, Iran's domestically as far as human rights was, uh, was concerned. However, however, when the relation with the West is uh, very bitter and uh, very hostile, it doesn't help because then the Islamic government says that I can do what I like with uh, with my own uh, this regardless of the of the reaction that uh, that I will have from the, from the, from the west so the relation with the west i think it um, in in many ways it will influence and have an effect on iran's uh, the, the dissident and uh, the question the important question of human rights uh, in iran Thank you. You still have one minute. If you'd like to make any other comments, you still have one minute. No, I, I, as I said, the, the reverse, unfortunately, the reverse is, is true. And we have observed it that, that, that whenever that there have been um, a great deal of hostility with the, with the West, the, the human rights situation in Iran has deteriorated. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Professor Farmer Farmayan, we come back to you with this question that allow me to briefly give you this introduction that according to the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, by the end of 2020, almost 30% of the Iranian population went under the absolute line of poverty. It means that one in three Iranians, by the morning when they wake up, they do not know if they will have a roof upon their head by night or not. Also, we see that this combination of the Islamic Republic, the Republican part is decreasing day by day. Do you think that Islamic Republic is facing the same path that North Korea wants across? And do you think that it's becoming more of an Islamic state? It's a very good question. And um, First of all, I think that one has to draw a distinction between the systems and the economic uh, approach in some place like North Korea, in fact, in some place like Venezuela versus uh, in Iran. Iran is uh, still at least a hybrid system that includes a, a great degree of uh, capitalistic, entrepreneurial, small business development. And I think that that has a very different effect in terms of how we see its progression going. However, it is uh, definite that the, the sanctions have had a, a significant effect on the economic well being of the population. Uh, I think this has contributed to uh, a number of different. Um, Outcomes. One is, I, I think today, for the first time, actually, 
the Iranian middle class, of which about 25% of the middle class has dropped to poverty level, where had the sanctions not been reimposed, had the JCPOA been allowed to continue, it was expected that actually there would be a rise in the number of people in the, in the middle class. I think for the first time, we're really feeling uh, a sense inside Iran, from what I can tell from the people I speak to, that the, uh, the blame is being placed somewhat on the American role in, uh, in walking out of the JCPOA and its impact, particularly during a time of COVID. So I find it quite interesting that you quote a, an IMF um, a report which also, of course, has shown that Iran's economy, for whatever reasons, um, is beginning to bounce back as many economies are uh, across the COVID uh, landscape. It's not going to jump back enough uh, to really draw the people out of poverty that have fallen into poverty. And I think it's also one of those cases where it's quite interesting to see the, what Hamati has been saying in the debate, uh, particularly this last debate, where he is saying that one of the greatest problems is the structural issue that is uh, making Iran so badly run. And it's because the various power centers have got to become better, uh, less corrupt and more um, communicative and the entire capital market has to be changed. And I think that makes him perhaps one of the most interesting uh, candidates we've seen for a while. And I would be very surprised actually, even if he loses this, which is likely that we will not see him continue either going back to the central bank or in some other position because the economy, I think those at the top recognize the very fact that he was accepted as a, um, as a candidate and passed the, the uh, strict requirements shows that he is part of the system. And I think they recognize that a, an economist that can work with the, with the regime, help it not lose face, while nonetheless getting some economic changes in place, which he's done consistently, um, would be very useful. So I think it's perhaps useful for all of us to know who he is now that he is running, because much as, um, as was pointed out by uh, Dr. Vatanka, we didn't know very much about Raisi until a few years ago. We certainly didn't know a lot about Hemati until this time around. And it's quite useful to know who's in the background and what they're doing and what their, their histories are. Thank you. You still have one minute if you'd like to make any other comments. Well, I, very quickly, I think that one of the difficulties um, in, in Iran at the moment is that the, um, that it is, suffer it, there's a combination, a hybrid again, of a sense that if they had only been allowed to access their foreign reserves, or if they had been allowed by the IMF to get the loan that the IMF um, uh, has denied them, or if they'd been allowed to have uh, uh, humanitarian aid, that the situation would be better. So I think there is a, a sense of, of being caught. And I do wonder, it is a, a very difficult uh, regime um, election, I think, to judge where the regime is because it is a very specific election and the next one around may be quite different again. Thank you, thank you so much. Let me go to Mr. Javed Al-Fat. Jan, we heard Dr. Fama Fama but allow me to add something that besides economic problems and the crisis of democracy, we are also facing another matter that you also mentioned in the event at the Begin Center, drought. Drought has been brought to Iran as a matter, as a result of mismanagement. What's your opinion on that? Um, you know, unfortunately, part in, in, in this region, we're facing a severe drought. Other countries, neighboring countries such as Iraq uh, have faced the drought. Also Jordan, uh, Israel supplies part of Jordan's water system. Uh, Iran is facing a drought, but also there have been mismanagement of the water systems from, for, for Iran's water resources for many years. And um, we saw it with the Revolutionary Guard in the 1990s, uh, building dams at an unprecedented rate. Iran was, I think, in terms of dam construction, was the top five in the world. Um, and, uh, you know, even the, the IRGC became so good at building dams, they built abroad also in Armenia, in Nicaragua, 
Um, but unfortunately, we've reached this stage where, according to uh, Dr. Kaveh Madani, who served in Iran's uh, Ministry of Environment, and unfortunately, he was hounded out. Uh, he had to escape, and he's now at Yale. Uh, Iran's water resources are bankrupt, basically. It's beyond replaceable. It's bankrupt. It's like a bankrupt person, a person who doesn't have enough money uh, in the bank, and they know they, don't, they can't replace the, 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 the money that they're taking out. Um, and uh, spending it. And uh, this is something uh, that is, uh, that is uh, very dangerous for, first of all, for the future of Iran and also for the Islamic Republic. And I am separating the two because uh, unfortunately I'm not seeing much done by the, by the regime. I Iran needs to have, uh, soon after the JCPOA was signed, uh, Mr. Rouhani did want to sign some agreements with some German companies and to bring more experts into Iran, uh, but we saw some of the environmentalists were arrested, uh, and one of them unfortunately committed suicide uh, after he was arrested, an Iranian-Canadian environmentalist also. Uh, sorry? Dr. Kabus Seyyed Amami. May he rest in peace. Um, and uh, you know, I Iran needs to have investment in this. This is not something that, that, sh that can be taken for granted. This is not something also that Iran can handle on its own. Iran needs full international cooperation uh, to deal with this, with this issue. But we saw soon after the uh, nuclear deal went into effect in, by 2016, this, they started testing ballistic missiles uh, and they wrote on it, Israel must be wiped out of the face of the earth. In Hebrew, they did it so that we get the message. And they did other things to push the international community away. And this is before Trump canceled the, uh, canceled the nuclear deal. And of course, the, the sanctions that is imposed were much worse. But the situation with the drought, um, it, it is something that, look, already, according to Professor Sariul Ghalam, um, I, think he's, I think the number was 5 million. 5 million Iranians have already left southern Iran to go to northern Iran. Uh, in search of uh, water resources. People in, uh, in uh, Sistan and Baluchistan province in south uh, eastern Iran are the well, majority Sunni. They're moving to Mashhad, and, which is a mainly Shia city with the Imam Reza shrine. And some of the uh, extremist Ayatollah are, are accusing them of a Sunni takeover of the city. So it's already creating tensions. And um, if I can quote also an, another, an Iran expert on, on the water issue, Nikol Hange Kousar, we just don't see this issue being addressed with seriousness because uh, already this summer, there are going to be cities that, that are going to face water shortages, water rations, they're going to, they're going to face water rations. And, uh, and, the, and the rainfall is not promising to be good uh, in the next uh, years. And uh, you know there, there will be more migration there will, uh, from from places where, which are hit by the drought. There will be more unemployed uh, farmers. The, the cities are going to see more people migration, especially in the north uh, from the south. And I think this will create tensions also different between different ethnicities. So I think Iran, the country that we know and and we love, uh, is going to change because of this crisis. I'm not talking about the Islamic Republic. I'm talking about Iran itself, its fabric of uh, ethnicities and its uh, environmental character and environmental makeup is is facing an unprecedented danger. And you know, if Mr. This is not the issue of just the Islamic Republic not being democratic. Even if there was full democracy and Ayatollah Khamenei was fully democratically elected, the terrible performance of, of the system, the political system of Iran, which as I said, is almost not functioning, uh, is, is, is adding to this uh, disaster which will change the face of Iran uh, for generations to come. Thank you, thank you so much. Mr. Natakhov, back to you. We heard our panelists, but allow me to add a very quick introduction that in order to Iran, if Iran wants to join the international banking system, it should be able to have international transactions. And we can see that for the past few years, they have not been able to confirm and pass the bill of the FATF and the Palermo Convention that goes against the money laundering procedure and the fundings for terrorism. Do you think without approving FATF, Iran can, have economic improvements. Well, thank you. I'll get to that in a second. If I may just uh, respond also quickly to the issue of the uh, drought in Iran. Um, 
my good friend uh, Mayer in Israel talks about, you know, Iran looking for German experts to come and help Iran. You know what, that would be great, but there are many, many, many very talented Iranians who could do that too, who have been forced to flee their country. And the fact that there is no program in place uh, except token gestures and empty offices that once in a while get launched to deal with the diaspora affairs. There is nothing systematic being done by the Islamic Republic to tap into the human uh, talents and potential of, of, of the Iranian diaspora and of course the Iranians in Iran. Uh, I mean, this is about mismanagement. And you know, I hate to keep, keep going back to Ayatollah Khamenei. I'm not here to, uh, to do any personal attacks, but the fact is Ayatollah Khamenei has been the supreme leader of this system for 32 years. If he stays in power another five years, he's been there as long as the Shah was, okay? Whereas the Shah focused on modernization and the Shah had many faults. There are many issues that one can criticize the Shah about, but he did focus on the nation, home building, right? If you talk to a certain generation of Iranians, they will tell you what, when they grew up in the 50s and 60s in Iran, that was very different from their parents' generation who grew up in the 20s and the 30s. That was the legacy of the Pahlavi family, which I said had many issues. They were certainly not Democrats, but they did build up Iran. Uh, Islamic Republic has done some of that. They began to do some of that in the 1980s. But as this system has evolved, it has become obsessed, particularly with the Arab world, particularly in the region. Money that doesn't exist has been spent around in the region in places like Syria and Iraq and Lebanon and so forth. And I'm not sure if that return investment is going to be there. We're can anybody on this panel please tell me what Iran gets out of being in, in the region to the extent that it, that it is? And Iran is not the only country that is making this mistake of overreaching and being in the region. But then the thing in the case of Iran, because of the lack of money and the sanctions, uh, it has even less money to spend, therefore less reason to be involved in the region and should focus on, on the home front, on, on building up capacity in communities in Iran that are hurting in Sistan of Baluchistan, in Kurdistan, in other parts of Iran that, you know, people are hurting. We see it. The world sees it. This is not an era where you don't see what's going on. We see what's going on. This is not propaganda being put together by three-lettered intelligence agencies. These are real Iranian suffering. And Ayatollah Khamenei is mostly, it seems to me, you know, occupied with talking about the axis of resistance. You know, axis of resistance doesn't fill the stomachs of empty, uh, or hungry Iranians. And that's, that's a problem. And it takes me to your issue of FATF. Look, the Financial Action Task Force is not some uh, unusual condition that has been asked of Iran. Every country out there, and I'm quoting Abdul Nasser Hemati, who said this in one of the presidential deba debates, every country is a member of the FATF, broadly speaking, and the, the uh, smaller uh, agreements that are tied to it, except Iran and not North Korea, right? Well, there's one big difference between Iran and North Korea. North Korea doesn't really talk about attracting billions of dollars in investment and wants to be a big trading partner, wants to be a hub. These are things that the Islamic Republic wants to be wants to be attract, uh, attractive for foreign investors and all the rest of it. If you want to do that, then you have to abide by international norms and rules. You have to clean up your act. You can't be going around in a neighborhood and acting in a militant revolutionary way and say, I'm gonna bring the, uh, the global order down. Mahmoud Ahmadinejad famously said that. I wanna bring the global order down and then say to the same global order backed by financial institutions, why don't you come and invest in Iran so we can create jobs for our young? It just doesn't work that way. I mean, I'm not saying something that hopefully is controversial. It's so obvious as daylight. But unfortunately, you know, FATF has been lingering now in the expediency council for I don't know how many years. Mohsen Rezai, who is supposed to be the secretary of the expediency council, doesn't want to admit that he's the reason um, that this FATF bill has not gone anywhere. Again, it takes us to the issue of who's, who's responsible. Where's this issue of transparency, accountability? These are missing and that need to fix it before you, the country can move forward. Thank you so much. Professor Ziva Kalam, do you think that Iran might eventually become an Islamic state or a country such as North Korea, especially considering the way that the COVID-19 pandemic was managed in Iran? Particularly, I'm talking about 
the lack of permission for the importance of vaccines from the United Kingdom and the United States. The floor is yours. No, I don't think uh, Iran would ever uh, tear into uh, North Korea. Although there are many Iranians uh, who fear such, uh, such a dreadful... Um, Sir, we cannot hear you. Korean state. Uh, in fact, in fact, Shahin, I doubt even if Iran would turn into uh, a, a Chinese state model, uh, there are, of course, there are, of course, many, many Iranian, uh, many, amongst hardline Iranians, uh, Revolution Regard leaders, etc., who wish that uh, the Iran will have uh, the, the, the same revolution that happened in China. That is to say, um, the, 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 the great economic achievement, but uh, no political development. There are uh, many Iranian leaders who love a Chinese scenario to, to be repeated in Iran, uh, have enough bread, have some um, economic progress without political development, without uh, consideration for human rights. I think even that will not happen in Iran, the Chinese model, let alone, um, let alone North Korean model, for the simple reason that um, uh, that, that uh, there is a there is a strong historical, uh, social and political development in Iran. Iran was the uh, was the first country who fought Iranian for a constitutional revolution. When constitutional uh, revolution happened in Iran uh, um, in in one hundred and fifteen years ago. Uh, there were barely any democrat, any democratic states in um, in Asia. Uh, China was a very, uh, uh, Japan was very authoritarian. Russia was very much authoritarian, and uh, with the exception of India, uh, which because of the British rule, uh, there were some democracy and uh, democratic uh, values. Um, there were no other country in in Asia that. Uh, that uh, that experienced uh, a parliamentary system, political freedom and uh, freedom of uh, expression, freedom of press that constitutional revolution brought for it, uh, brought for uh, for Iran, as I said, 115 years ago. Since then, since then, Iran has a record of a number of political prisoners, of the newspapers that have been shot down. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So it would be very difficult with that historical background. It would be very difficult um, to to have a North Korean uh, state um, uh, in Iran. There are there are there are uh, some uh, uh, five to eight million uh, Iranian expatriates living in, in in the West, and they have a strong ties with. Uh, uh, with, uh, with Iranian uh, families, relatives, etc. They come and go, uh, you, and the government cannot uh, prevent them from, um, from coming to Iran and visiting their relatives, etc., etc. There are, there are, at the moment that we are talking with each other, there are, there are four million Iranian students. I have, a, in, in social media, I, ha I have over one million followers. My, my Instagram uh, page um, and 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 uh, my Twitter account uh, reaches about two hundred seventy thousand uh, <laughs> followers. I'm not alone. Of course, there are many people like me in Iran. So it would be very difficult to imagine that uh, that uh, a very a very autocratic government, uh, uh, centralized government, uh, could control eighty five million uh, Iranian. Uh, uh, pop, uh, population. So I think that um, even though there might be some Iranian leaders who would love to see uh, a North Korean style of uh, a style of uh, political establishment in Iran, when the, the, the government, when there is no opposition, when there is no dissension, 
when there is no criticism against government, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, but uh, it, it will not happen. It will not happen. It would be very difficult to foresee uh, such a scenario for um, uh, for uh, for Iran, Shahin. Thank you, thank you, sir. Allow me to conclude this session by asking each of our panelists a question regarding their expertise. Dr. Farma Farmayan, how do you see the fusion of Iran and UK relations as a result of tomorrow's outcome? Thank you, Shaheen. Um, well, first of all, before answering that, but in that context, I just uh, would like to add the fact that I've seen the epic Iran um, show today at the Victoria and Albert, which itself is a reflection of the relationship between uh, Iranian culture and Iranian history and British uh, culture and history. And, um, and I think one of the things that really stood out in that to me was the many times that Iranians showed themselves to approach things uh, in an unorthodox and unexpected way that simply didn't follow the existing rules, whether it was the rules of framing a, a miniature or whether it was the rules of religion at that time. And we see this over and over again. I think if we think back at the time of the Pahlavis, the Shah was thought of as immovable. It was unable to be imagined that the monarch would be overthrown and it happened. I think this is a country of extraordinary originality and of uh, very difficult to organize. I think people do operate very much original uh, approaches and viewpoints and they've got them very strongly. I think that at the moment there is very little relationship between the British and the Iranians, although the uh, British too are very eccentric and I think there is an element of, of commonality, uh, but I think at the moment, certainly most people in uh, leaders in the EU have said that should Raisi be elected, they have a real problem with his uh, human rights background and that there will be issues. On the other hand, I think we really should look at the fact that uh, sanctions and the way that the foreign, the Western world has looked at Iran uh, has been extremely damaging for 40 years. It's been under sanctions. We can certainly nitpick about how badly it's run, how it's not making the right decisions, how its um, environment is, is uh, failing, as it is the world over, by the way. But the, uh, the issue, I think, is there is no country that has had to handle the kind of economic isolation as well as political isolation. The people did not overthrow the Shah with the intent to have the next several decades expressed by enmity with the US, the world's unipolar power, and it has been devastating. And I think that what we would, we would expect to see is perhaps some change that brings the citizenry, they became citizens when the Shah was overturned, and that is something they value. They do still elect a president, many of them. And I think that what we would hope to see is that this is a nadir and that there may be some improvement. And Iran is a country with many, many years of history as the epic Iran showed me today. And so I think of this as just a few years in a very small period of time when clerics have been running the show. So I think there could be a great number of changes over the next few decades. And let's think of it that way. Thank you so much. Mr. Javed Alfar, Mayor Jen, how do you see the future of the relations, if there are any, but on an international level between Iran and Israel, especially considering the new government in, in Israel. Do you think that having a coherent system of presidency, judiciary, and the parliament in Iran can actually help to stabilize the new Bennett government in Israel? Something that many analysts believe that happened during the Netanyahu government. Um. Before I start, I just uh, have to uh, explain how they see, quickly describe how Israelis see Iran. I lived in England for 16 years. And I can tell you, somebody who lived in England as an Iranian and somebody who lived in Israel as an Iranian, Israelis have a much more positive view of the people of Iran than, than in England. And here it's amazing. They really always say, yes, but the people are not like the regime. They always say that, you know, the people of Iran have a great history. Um, 
And it is actually positive discrimination. Unfortunately, we have a lot of racism against Arabs, but when it comes to Iranians and Persians, it's actually very positive. It's because of the history. Cyrus the Great saved the Jews. It's also because the, uh, there were Israelis who lived in Iran prior to the revolution, and I haven't met one of them who didn't like the country. It's also because uh, Iranian Israelis who, uh, who were born in Iran and moved here always speak very nicely about the culture and the people of Iran. And last but not least is the phenomenal success of Iranian cinema. Post-revolution Iranian cinema has been very successful in Israel. And um, so this has created this image among the people of Iran. And even the current prime minister, um, um, Naftali Bennett, when he was interviewed, I remember like six months ago, he went out of his way to tell when he was being interviewed by Iran International, I'm not putting the people of Iran in the same box as the Islamic Republic. Uh, so, so we have that issues that they, they go, they're very careful not to uh, generalize and they see the people different and the people, the image of the people of Iran here is actually very positive. In terms of uh, how Israel sees Iranian uh, political system, look, um, in the 1980s, uh, there was one country that was lobbying for uh, Iran in Washington in the early 1980s, and that was the state of Israel. Ariel Sharon was a big lobbyist and a huge lobbyist for Iran was Shimon Peres, whose surname actually Peres in, in Polish means Persian. His surname was, he was Shimon Persian. And uh, he also uh, lobbied the Americans uh, with the hope that, you know, you sell weapons to Iran, hopefully they will open the doors with the moderates. It will improve the situation. Israel itself sold, sold lots of weapons, but uh, you know, uh, it didn't work. Instead of improving relations with Israel, so after the, you know, towards the end of the Iran-Iraq war, that Iran was uh, supplying weapons to, some of the weapons that Israel was supplying to Iran to fire on the Iraqis were being transferred by Iran to Hezbollah to fire on Israeli soldiers. And uh, we saw that Iran started supporting Jihad Islami and, uh, and Hamas. I think Israel was one of the first countries to discover this revolutionary versus Republican because the Israelis saw that, you know, um, before, the, before the Oslo peace talks, Raf Sanjani said, whatever the Palestinians accept, it's okay with us, with the Israelis, whatever decision, because Raf Sanjani, you know, he was the Sheikh Sazandegi, he wanted to rebuild the country, he didn't want to entangle Iran in all these other problems. But Khamenei went and arranged the Palestine conference, uh, of course, with Mr. Muhtashami Poor, who recently went to the other side. Um, and they, uh, you know, they said, no, we will support Hamas and Islamic Jihad, and we are against any peace with the state of Israel. And we saw it continue with the first intifada, with the second intifada. And, um, you know, we had the Iran-Libya Sanctions Act that was uh, the sanctions imp imposed during Rafsanjani. Uh, the reason being that the <clears throat> Islamic Republic maybe didn't realize and maybe did realize that the peace process was very important to President Clinton and they were undermining it with support for Hamas and Islamic Jihad. So overall, it's not changing and uh, unfortunately I have to say, I think we're going to see more of the same uh, with uh, Bennett, although I think he's going to manage our relations with America more responsibly, but with regards to Iran, uh, I don't think we're going to see any change. Thank you so much. Allow me to go to Mr. Rafael Khan. Sir, how do you see the future of Iran relations with Biden administration in two and a half minutes, please? Uh, I have to be very quick. I mean, look, very quickly on Israel, because the big issue is actually very relevant to the policy debate on Iran here in Washington. You cannot separate the issue of Israel uh, from what's going on in U.S.-Iran relations. So let's keep that there, because frankly, uh, you know, United States and Iran can sign five nuclear agreements in Vienna over the next five days, but that would not mean U.S.-Iran relations will be normal. The only time I can see, and I speak to you here from Washington, the only time I can see U.S.-Iran relations being normalized is when Iran takes a very different approach towards the state of Israel. And it's not some big conspiracy theory that I'm speaking of. The Western world, United States included, want to see Iran take a different approach to the question of Israel. You cannot have one UN member threaten basically another UN, uh, UN member. And I know the Israelis have carried out operations in Iran and it's a two-way street. I all know that, but we also know who started this fight in 1979. It was not the Israelis. Um, I, I, look, I, also, if I may, you only gave me two minutes, but very quickly to uh, our friend. Two and a half, sir, like other guests. 
Yeah, yeah. Professor Ziba Kalam said China uh, is preferred by some hardliners in Iran. And on, like Mayor, unfortunately, I cannot go to the country of my birth either. So I would love for uh, Professor Ziba Kalam to tell those hardliners who might believe it because I know he disagrees with him. China too has good relations with Israel. China too trades with the rest of the world. China too has questions about what Iran is doing in the region. So the idea that China is gonna save the day for the Islamic Republic, it's just not gonna happen. Very quickly on Biden. President Biden wants to put the Iranian nuclear issue aside, stop the nuclear clock from ticking, but this is a president who's focused on American domestic politics. There are a lot of issues in the United States that need to be fixed. He wants to be the president that focuses on the home front and not you know, engage in any more foreign policy kind of questionable policies, particularly in the Middle East. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I had more time and I didn't yes. even know it, but yes. that's fine. I'll pass. Okay. Thank you so much. Allow me go to go to Professor Zubak Alam. Sir, how do you see the future of what is left of Iranian reformist front? I I began my uh, my discussion with uh, with this phrase that uh, this uh, election is the landmark um, uh, of the Islamic Republic history. Now, one of the points, one of the elements which actually make that uh, landmark is uh, what has happened to the reformists. Now, I think this election more or less brought the end of the reformists. You know, Shahin, there is a, there is, there is a old uh, medieval uh, saying that uh, that when the king was dead in in Britain, the the the, the courtier used to say that uh, the king is dead. Long live the king! Now, uh, reformists, uh, as we know them, uh, Mr. Khatami and, and and the rest, I think they are dead but long live the, the, the reformists because the forces, the reasons that created the reform movement in Iran 24 years ago are much stronger today than 24 years ago. Those forces, they have not disappeared. Mm -hmm. they, they, they have not evaporated and gone to, to, uh, to the sky. If anything, they are more powerful as a latent force which are pressing for change in Iran than they were 24 years ago. So although the, the leaders, the prominent figure of the reformists are dead because people no longer respect them, people no longer believe in them, people no longer obey them, people no longer have any any, any, any faith in them, but the forces for change amongst younger generation Iranian, amongst Iranian youth, Iranian women, uh, minority, Sunnis, et cetera, et cetera, is much stronger uh, than they ever were in, 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 in 24 years ago. And I believe that sooner or later, this latent force would actually create um, a, a, a new generation of, uh, of, of reformist leaders uh, in Iran. So I, I, I think uh, we, would, we, would, we would see a um, uh, reformist movement in, in future of Iran, but with different, uh, with different uh, figures, with different uh, leaders. Thank you. thank you so much. Thank you so much. Allow me to once again thank you. Dr. Roxana Farma Farmayel from King's College London, Mr. Nehru Javed Alfa from IDC Australia, Mr. Alexa Vatan Khah from Middle East Institute, and Dr. Sadaq Ziba Kalam from University of Tehran. Now the floor is open for questions. Dr. Gropi. Beautiful then, thank you very much to, uh, uh, to you, Shaheen, for brilliantly uh, sharing this uh, to our guests for uh, so eloquently explaining uh, to even people like like myself, right? So we're not familiar with this. So you have provided us such a nuanced picture. Uh, amazing. So thank you very much for that. 
Um, I know that it is pretty late, especially in Iran, in, uh, in Tehran. We have a number of questions. Pl um, please, um, our guests, forgive me. I'm not going to be able, obviously, to ask all of your questions. So we're just going to be asking one for each uh, uh, of our panelists. Um, uh, Professor Zibakaran, let's start from you. Uh, Gassem here in the chat uh, asked uh, uh, something very interesting and, uh, in my opinion, provocative, uh, given what you've just said. What is your prediction, um, prediction, Professor, 10 years from now, uh, as for democracy in Iran? Do you see any light at the end of the tunnel? Thank you. Yes, I see, uh, uh, I see uh, <laughs> a beautiful sun, not only, not only light. I see a beautiful uh, sun at the end of the tunnel, because as I said, the new generation of Iranian social media, Iranian intellectual, Iranian expatriate, you simply cannot put them all in uh, Evin prison. So I think uh, there would be, uh, there would be much hope um, and light at the end of the tunnel in 10 years time. Many, many thanks, uh, Professor, for this. Um, Dr. Parman Fanyan, let's, let's start from you. Um, I, I'm, I'm pretty much putting up like two questions together and I'm not asking this uh, with any like arrogance or whatsoever. But if you could call the shots, uh, personally speaking, what would an ideal Iran look like, ask uh, Saraj? What would you change? And uh, uh, I do not want to me, um, I, I do not want to be dis disrespectful or anything, like that, especially if uh, you and the other panelists cannot go back to Iran. So please, like, excuse me, but given everything that you said uh, and a number of the questions here, I think that this is very an interesting question to ask you. The floor is yours, doctor. Thank you. Well, I think an ideal Iran would certainly be one economically that was flourishing better than it is today. And so I, my ideal could start coming in quite soon. And that is that there be a signature and a rejoining of the JCPOA and a great deal of compliance. And I think that the interesting element of that is, first of all, I think we'd all sleep better just knowing that the nuclear program is going down. And I speak for Iranians inside as well as outside Iran on that one. And I think the entire temperature of the Gulf would re go down. And I think that another really ideal element would be for a more regional understanding, both in terms of security and in terms of uh, political engagement and economic trade would be very helpful. And we're already seeing that with the renewal or, or the beginning of the Saudi uh, Iranian discussions. We're seeing that in, in order to try to solve the Yemen problem, we're also uh, seeing a lot more discussion between the UAE and um, Iran. And that is very heartening because both of those two countries on that side of the Gulf really uh, have much, have the strongest militaries. And I think it's very important for there to be greater peace at this point. I think that having some kind of engagement with the United States is helpful. I think that in many ways, what is un, un I, I think unfortunately, a lot of people that are signing the, or thinking that we will get a JCPOA are thinking, okay, let's sign that. And then we'll have this whole laundry list of other negotiations that will go through. And I think that is very unlikely because the uh, security elements as has been amply pointed out by my fellow colleagues is simply not in the portfolio of the president. And I think that it's important. My ideal would be to give Iran some breathing room to come out of the COVID, come out of the sanctions, and then perhaps to be able to see whether the next generation, which Dr. Um, Ziba Kalam has talked about, and indeed we're seeing the end of the revolutionary generation. It is a period of turnover. So let's see what they come up with. And my ideal would be that it begin to handle uh, a number of the internal problems that have been caused, I think, because a lot of it is just simply pressure on the outside. Any country for any reason that's pressured on the outside is going to then put pressure on the inside. And that's been the irony, I think, of sanctions is that it's led to poverty, it's led to statism, and in a sense created, helped create the very 
kind of state that has it was designed to try to avoid. So reduce the sanctions, increase the human rights, increase the opportunities inside, and increase the um, negotiations on the outside, and it would be in a much better place, and that would be an ideal. Many thanks, <clears throat> Doctor, for this. Really, really, really appreciate it. Um, Director Vatanha, actually, uh, same question to you, especially given that you had mentioned the return or the lack of return of all those minds, uh, engineers, uh, teachers, uh, also the people uh, uh, of uh, Iran descent who live outside, who could really turn things around. Um, how would you, I mean, could you please comment on that as well? Thank you. Well, uh, in the interest of time, I'll be very quick, but I think I'm not alone when I say this. Um, just a few days ago, um, uh, the body of a young toddler washed up or was found uh, well, as actually was found months ago, but it, the identity of this toddler was confirmed as an Iranian uh, Kurdish child that in an attempt to cross from France to the United Kingdom, the boat capsized and the, you know, the family drowned and this child, bo child's body was found months, months later in the cold waters of, of, of a Norwegian fjord. It makes you want to cry that this is what happened to Iran. That Iranians are found drowning off the coast of Papua New Guinea in the fjords of Norway, the British Channel. I mean, it just, what has Ayatollah Khamenei got to say for this? Why do people leave if things are so great? Why is there a five to seven million Iranian diaspora that didn't exist before 1979? Why do Iranians want to leave if things are so nice? And that is a question you have to ask and remind them every day because he can choose to be the leader of a small Iran within a large Iran. But he has to fear the day the large Iran wakes up and wants the old Iran back, and an Iran that's for all Iranians. Because right now Ayatollah Khamenei is hell-bent on having Iran for him and his few inner circle. My, my proposition to you is that's not going to be sustainable. One day, and he might be gone by that day, he might be somebody else, but this approach, this path of my way or the highway is simply not going to be sustainable in the long term. Many thanks, uh, Director Vatanka. Um, Mr. Javan Afar, um, I mean, a last question to you. If you could send a message uh, from Israel to the people of Iran uh, I mean, before tomorrow, what would that be? Thank you. Um, uh, I hope that, uh, that the two countries will be reunited in friendship, and I hope that we will be able to uh, travel to Iran and Iranians can travel here and I hope that Israel can share especially its experience in uh, in water technology. We are the only country in this region who has a water surplus uh, with Iran to help Iran fight the uh, fight the, uh, the drought and I welcome uh, and I will welcome dialogue with the, with the people of Iran on the question of Palestine. You know I think many of them have a very rightful point that they want to they want to support the people of Palestine also, but they just don't agree with the, with the extremist language that's coming out of Iran. So hopefully we can have debates right here in Tel Aviv with the with Iranians on the question of Palestine and the question of Israel. The two countries have a lot of things that can contribute to each other. They can learn from each other. What's going on is un completely unnecessary. And it was started, unfortunately, by the by the post-revolutionary regime in Iran, because the regime lives uh, thrives in isolation. Uh, you know, um, yes, Iran has been for 40 years under sanctions, but on numerous occasions it, it facilitated the, the imposition of these sanctions with its with its act. So, I'm I'm just hoping and 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 dreaming about the day when we can travel to Iran and Iranians can come here and the two countries can do a lot, especially on the question of drought. I'm sure that my students are sick to death of hearing me going on and on about the question of drought, but I think that's something that, that is of great concern and this is something that Israel can do a lot uh, uh, to help. Um, and also I hope that some of my students who learn about Iran can, make, can visit Iran and so they can see the country for its beauty from first hand. Thanks here in Tehran. Inshallah. <laughs> Amen. Beautiful then. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Like to once again to I mean, King's College London, the School of Security, ITSS Verona, uh, our wonderful chair Shahim Modares. Uh, thank you for putting this wonderful panel together, and to all our guests uh, and our friends from the United Kingdom, Italy, um, and obviously Iran and uh, um, and the international uh, arena. Thank you again. Hopefully, we will continue this uh, this discussion. 
mean, later on, uh, have a great night uh, again, especially I mean, professor. And um, I know that uh, it is late in uh, in uh, uh, in uh, Tehran. So again, I thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I mean, for this uh, and uh, have a have a great rest uh, of the day or or good night. Thank Bye you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us. Bye. -bye. Good night, everyone. Good night, sir. Thank you for joining us and giving us your time. Welcome.